Is overtraining real? Or are we just being babies? We're gonna find out and we're gonna start right now. Okay, so the main thing that we're gonna focus on here is what is overtraining? We know that athletes get into these deep, dark places. We know that athletes start to struggle with various aspects around strength training. They start to think and question their entire life, their entire existence. Should they really go on as an athlete? And then they start to think like, hey, maybe I'm just overtrained. Maybe I need a break. Maybe I need to step back. Maybe I need a huge deload week or a huge period of, of a deload. And we have to understand, like, is this actually real? Does overtraining really exist? So when we see a massive decrease in motivation and that leads to a loss of aggression, when they're attacking their training life, are those aspects, the loss of aggression, the loss of motivation, a telltale sign around overtraining or is the athlete just under recovered? Is the athlete dealing with various stress from outside of the actual physical stimuli that they're getting in the weight room? So we're gonna cover all these different aspects, whether or not overtraining is real, what potentially could cause overtraining, and then how we can figure this stuff out as athletes and as coaches to really attack the overtraining aspect behind long-term development. Okay, so in literature, what is the scientific definition of overtraining syndrome? Overtraining syndrome is defined as being maladapted to stimuli, leading to perturbations in multiple body systems, creating underperformance. And so technically this is seen as a performance decrement for at least two months, ideally two plus months. So two months, three months or more, that's where we're gonna see a decrease in overall performance of the athlete. From the literature being an unexplained underperformance. I sort of see this ironically as it's all on the athlete. The underperformance is really the cause is from the athlete. Inside the literature, there's nothing that says Maybe the coach sucks. Maybe the coach uh, didn't create a proper periodization scheme. Maybe the coach wasn't listening to the athlete. It's more so as an unexplained underperformance. And so some of those symptoms that athletes will see outside of their unexplained underperformance is fatigue, loss of motivation, depression, hypertension, anxiety, weight loss, endocrine problems, so some issues with their hormones, and then loss of concentration. And so epidemiology is telling us that it's a very rare situation but it doesn't mean that this isn't happening in sports. So it is rare from the clinical perspective, but we also have to realize that it's rare to be training long-term. It's rare to be training at an elite level. So the actual rate inside the high performance industry might be higher than we actually realize. And so how can this help us? I think the first step is like, what causes this unexplained underperformance? How can we figure out the cause behind those overall symptoms. And so first we have to look at, all right, if we're looking for an adaptation from an athlete, we want to target the athlete with these overreaching principles. We can create a massive amount of stimuli. They're doing heavy squats. They're doing heavy weightlifting movements. They're doing plyometric movements. They're doing their technical sport. And maybe they're in an intense phase of their technical sport as well. And all of those things cause the body to sort of break down over time and become fatigued. And so if the individual is not recovering effectively, that leads to this overreaching over a long period of time, which forces the athlete into the dark depths of misery, right? If we understand that that can cause overtraining, that can cause that drop off, we have to take that next step and say, all right, we need our athletes to recover as effectively as possible. We need the athletes to eat well, to sleep well, to do their mobility, to meditate, to focus on their overall mindfulness. And so the next thing that we have to start to bring in is if someone is under recovering or if they're being overtrained, has there been a new stimulus that the coaches might not be factoring in? So maybe there's outside work that starts to come into play. The individual has a new job. They're working more hours. It's more physically demanding. It's more mentally demanding. So that can also lead 
to a massive increase in overreaching, which then can lead to that underperformance. And oftentimes what we even see is an actual physical response where athletes start to change their nutrition without even recognizing it. They're having this decrease in motivation because of all the external stress that they might be bringing upon themselves. And so they're eating less. Uh, they have that loss of appetite, which then leads to a lower level of glycogen stores, which then leads to a lower positive feeling as they get into training, as they get into the weight room. And that can lead to an increase in 5-HTP, which can lead to an increase in tryptophan uptake, which then starts this negative cascading effect. So we know that an increase in external stress can lead to overtraining. We know that altering nutritional intake can decrease glycogen storage in the actual muscles, which can lead to a negative feeling. And then we also know that excessive oxidative work, so excessive amounts of aerobic training can also lead to overtraining. So doing an excessive amount of distance running or even hill sprints or long duration assault bike work and just doing this to an absurd amount without enabling our body to recover can lead to this excessive amount of oxidative inflammation, which then leads to that overtraining feeling. This is similar when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system. So we can start to study individuals and see, oh, there's a difference in their heart rate variability. So you have something as easy as a Fitbit, you can start to track your HRV, and now your HRV over time starts to become a little bit wonky. It starts to get a little bit more variable, and now you start to see, wow, when I'm sleeping, my heart rate is drastically higher than it had been in previous situations. And then you can start to see all right, well now I can backtrack. Well, I'm doing too much oxidative work. I'm not eating enough carbohydrates. I'm not recovering as well as I could because I have extra stress in my life. And this can also be seen when we're doing blood work. So when we're doing blood work, we can study things like cytokines. And if we see an increase in our inflammation, typically cytokines are gonna be drastically higher in that blood work. And so that's another way that we can see the endocrine result that is being caused by that poor recovery, the poor nutrition, or the absurdly high amount of oxidative work. And then that's gonna lead us into what other triggers we can study. Before we analyze the rest of the truth behind over training one of those key factors that we're going to talk about is making sure that our nutrition is on point and that goes along with making sure that you're getting at least one gram per pound of body weight of whey protein and you're sleeping well if we're taking something like 40 winks from earth fed muscle that's going to improve our sleep and our recovery because we're taking the absolute best products out there you can click on the link down in the description to improve your overall recovery so that you're not overtrained. And so a couple other triggers that we have to be aware of as coaches and as athletes is monotony and training. Okay, doing the same thing over and over and over again can lead to overtraining. Having too many competitions in a short period of time, that can also lead to a feeling of overtraining, mainly because you don't have the ability to back off from high intensity work and then try to recover. Or maybe you go through this high intensity phase and then immediately have to get back into a high volume phase before you cut the volume, lead to more high intensity, and then get into that stressful competitive state. This is different for our team sports in comparison to individual sports. And that's another key trigger is that most overtraining scenarios are going to be related entirely to individual sports. And then finally, we have to bring back up. If you're adding external stress to your life, that could cause a feeling of overtraining. So taking on more roles at a job, taking on more responsibility in life, you have a child, maybe you have more bills that you need to be paying because you lost funding from your NGV. These are all scenarios that can lead to that feeling of overtraining. So what can we do for this solution? How can we prevent all of these things from happening? Or at least how can we be more aware as coaches and more aware as athletes to prevent that excessive oxidative work, to prevent that drastic increase in cytokines, to prevent that low glycogen storage so that we don't feel so unmotivated, to prevent that under recovery. And so this is where I would immediately recommend that every athlete, every coach has some situation set up where you can get blood work done quarterly or every six months. If you can do this quarterly, it's phenomenal because now you can start to understand your hormone panels and the ebbs and flows 
flows within your own individual hormonal panel. So you can start to see what's happening with your testosterone from training each quarter, what's happening with your cortisol, what's happening with your cytokines. So now you have a better reading of where that baseline is. And then every quarter you can see what the blocks of training have done to you hormonally. And typically you won't see any drastic changes, but when you do, that's when the red flag might come up. This is something personally where I can share in my own athletic career when I was training as a shot putter was I was throwing regularly, I was lifting regularly, and then all of a sudden, I started to get massive headaches. I started to feel terrible. I started to feel run down and fatigued. And at first it was, oh, well, I do have a child or, or I have a business and all this. And this is back in 2011, 2012, 2013. And I kept thinking, well, it's just because of this external stress. And then finally, I decided, you know what? I gotta go get blood work done. And when I went to get blood work done, my white blood cells were extremely off the charts. My testosterone was down around 220. So they started to think, hey, this guy might have lupus or an autoimmune disease, or he might have cancer of some sort. Let's get more blood work done. Let's get some x-rays done. And I started to just get hammered by doctors. Lo and behold, after about three months, they finally figured out I had four different types of Lyme disease. And so once they realized, wow, he has Lyme disease, we need to treat this infection and we need to treat it over a long period of time. That's when I could start that healing process. Now, where I'm going with this is that if I had been doing blood work quarterly or every six months, I would have had that baseline and I could have seen any perturbations in my endocrine system much earlier, but I wasn't doing that. And that's where doing that quarterly or every six month baseline work will help you heal, will help you with your recovery. And it could, in essence, prevent that overtraining. That next key concept is having a weekly recovery inventory. Have a simple sheet. And inside of that sheet, you have, what was your nutrition for the week? How much sleep did you get every single night? And I'm not plugging Fitbit because they're sponsoring this video. They're not sponsoring this video. I'm plugging the concept that if I use my Fitbit and average out how many hours each night that I've slept, I can look at a week to week basis what my sleep has been like. Okay, then I look at my nutrition. What were my macros like every single week? Then I can go into how many days a week was I doing yoga or meditative work or praying? How many days a week was I spending in the sauna? Uh, how many days a week was I actually exercising? How many days a week was I getting naps in? And how many days a week was I doing specific mobility work? And then ultimately how many times or how many sessions throughout the week was I unplugging, taking that step back from digital work and just focusing on my internal self? That's a recovery inventory that can help you prevent and be aware of overtraining and help you keep those symptoms subsided out of your existence. That third key step would be comprehend your recovery that you need from key competitions. Some athletes can handle a lot of competitions in a short period of time. Other athletes cannot. We have an experience with Haley Reichert where she can handle a ton of volume, a ton of intensity. She can go all the time. But if she has more than two competitions in a two month time frame, she gets shot. She gets broken down. She starts to feel fatigued. She starts to feel unmotivated. She doesn't know if she wants to keep doing the sport anymore. And that needs to be something that all of our coaches and the athletes are aware of. How long does it take to recover from competitions? Another key concept, be aware of a deload schedule for each individual. Some individuals, Haley, to go back to her example, she doesn't like deloads, okay? She gets beat up when she comes back. She gets extraordinarily sore and her body takes about two to three weeks to actually adapt. Other individuals do phenomenal, really, really high wired athletes tend to do very well with a deload system. I'll share an anecdotal story about Jonathan Edwards, the world record holder in the triple jump. Jonathan Edwards had been struggling. He had been stagnant around 1750 to 1770 in meters in the triple jump. He ends up getting sick. He got diagnosed with Epstein-Barr syndrome, which ironically, I also had when I was diagnosed with Lyme disease. But anyway, he had to take off from training for six months. As he came back from that six month deload, he had a massive increase in his trajectory. He started to improve his training. He started to feel better over time because he hadn't really had a deload period for about six or seven years. So that period of recovering from Epstein-Barr enabled his body to handle all the inflammation and to handle all the overreaching principles and enabled him to recover better and in essence, break the world record in the triple jump. And then finally, if we're even bringing back that example of Haley, if we're talking about women, women need to be in tune and their coaches need to be in tune with their menstrual cycle. That's a telltale sign 
behind too much training or under recovery. So if you're training women and you start to see that they're skipping their period, or they're skipping their menstrual cycle, or they're not getting their menstrual cycle at all, that's typically a red flag. Hey, they're not eating enough. Hey, they're, we're training them too hard. Hey, we're beating them down mentally and physically, or they have something else in their life that they're dealing with. And we need to be aware of what that menstrual cycle is so that we can use that to be aware of what's going on and how they're adapting to their training stimulus. So it's important to know that overtraining is actually real. It can be real, but you have to be aware of those symptoms and you have to be aware of ways that you can prevent that from happening. The first key step is to know what those symptoms are. Loss of motivation, fatigue, loss of appetite, lack of concentration, all of those things, underperformance, those are key symptoms behind overtraining. With that being said, we also as coaches need to know the period of training that the athlete is within. Are they in a high volume training phase? Are they in a high intensity training phase? And then how are they adapting to that? And that will help us be more aware of where they're at as individual athletes. That next key step is know the value of training inside of a group or training with a team. If we know that individual athletes, meaning athletes that are in sports like tennis and wrestling and weightlifting and throwing, individual athletes are almost always the ones that are suffering from overtraining. And this is because of the monotony. So if we can create a group around those individuals, meaning, you know, here at Garage Strength, we have our weightlifters train with our throwers. We try to create a group setting. Now we have a team and that can diminish the level of monotony. And now because it's squashing that monotony, it makes training a little bit more enjoyable and the motivation remains a little bit higher. That next key is that we always have to get that proper blood work done at least every six months. Ideally, it would be quarterly. And then finally, you have that recovery inventory where you understand what your nutritional aspects are each week. You understand how much sleep you're getting, how much meditative work, how much mindfulness you're doing, how much mobility that you're doing. So that in turn prevents overtraining. If you're a coach and you see that you're more prevalent to cause overtraining in your athletes, click on the link down below, head over to garagestrength.com and you can pick up our sports performance Bible to help you become a better coach and solve all of your athletes problems so that they perform at a high level and become world class. Remember, you've always got to recover as well as possible. And when you go into the gym, you have to cultivate your power. Peace.